All right, so we're all here to uh, listen to Dina's, or listen, hear about Dina's thesis defense. <laughs> Dina came to us from Syracuse, um, then the US Geological Survey, and then landed up, or ended up at Colorado School of Mines, um, where she was able to blend her undergraduate interest in biology and geology with environmental engineering to look at sulfate reducing bioreactors and sort of the biogeochemistry that's happening in those systems. And that'll be the focus of Dina's talk today. Um, this work has been associated with several publications already in press, another submitted uh, as of last night, um, and, and a couple others that will be coming out shortly. So a really nice body of research, um, including an invited talk uh, at ACS uh, coming up in a couple months. Um, after this, unfortunately, she'll be leaving us and moving to Washington State, but you'll miss sunny Colorado. Yeah, I'll miss you guys a little bit. Um, to go work at CDM Smith as an environmental scientist, where she'll be able to continue some of these themes of research in conjunction with uh, application and practice in environmental consulting. Uh, when not in the lab, Dina's an avid outdoors woman. She's run how many ultra marathons? 250Ks. Only two ultra marathons. Our 250Ks, as well as a series of marathons where she still manages to sort of integrate her passion for research with her passion for the outdoors, as you'll see when she shows pictures of a mind blowout um, when it relates to relevance. Um, committee members for Dina's thesis are Professor Higgins, Professor Figueroa, Professor Volker, Professor Speer, Dr. Robert Almstrand, who is streaming in from Sweden, and did I forget anybody? You. Oh, and myself. Yeah. Um, so with that, I'll leave, and uh, Dina can take the floor. <laughs> hey guys, <laughs> um, thank you for coming today and spending some time listening to what I've spent the last six years thinking about. Um, like Josh said, we're going to be talking about sulfate reducing bioreactors and how those are applied in uh, mining impacted water treatment. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, first, we have a little roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. I'll give you some motivation and background for the work we did. Um, quickly go over my experimental setups that we used to answer some of the questions we had, and then go through each of the chapters of my dissertation um, as they relate to our overarching questions. So hopefully I don't have to convince this room full of people that uh, mining influenced water has uh, extensive environmental impacts. Uh, these are settling ponds for a potash mine near Moab. And as you see, there's a receiving body of water right nearby. So um, we, we have concerns about situations like this. Um, these are pictures that uh, Josh referred to. So uh, my husband, Rune, and I did a 50K by the Gold King blowout that happened last summer. Um, so we took these pictures when we needed a little break from running. So these these are very iron rich, um, lots of uh, particulate matter, and did have some concerns downstream. So, um, and if you're not convinced about the environmental aspect, uh, maybe I can convince you by saying it's a very expensive problem um, and pretty pervasive in the Western United States. All those dots represent mines, all those red lines represent streams affected by mines, and those dark blue blotches are um, watersheds affected by over 300 mines. So this is an expensive problem to clean up. Um, worldwide, I've seen numbers upwards of $100 billion. Um, so it's something to consider as we move forward. Uh, luckily, we have passive treatment systems. And what I mean by passive is that you don't have to go out there and work on them on a regular basis. Um, you can just monitor them over time and make sure they're behaving themselves. Uh, this is a conceptual model of a sulfate reducing bioreactor, but let's break it down a little bit. So first, our sulfate reducing bioreactors are largely comprised of organic substrate. And um, so as this organic substrate degrades into simple organic acids and alcohols, we're consuming oxygen really quickly. Um, so that substrate changes over time, oxygen is consumed quickly. Um, also sulfate reducing bacteria, which we are dependent on for this whole system to work, don't really like typical uh, mine drainage pHs of less than three or two or whatever you get. Um, so we get a 
we add limestone to these systems to achieve a neutral pH. And over time, that limestone reactivity decreases um, as it becomes scaled or as it reacts with uh, metals and binds up. Uh, so we have this sulfate-rich water flowing into our reactor. And since we have no oxygen, uh, we have plenty of organic material, and we have a neutral pH, we're getting sulfate-reducing conditions really quickly. And so we're producing that sulfide, that gray line. And that sulfide will bind up with uh, divalent metals. My favorite flavor is zinc, but iron, cadmium, whatever, whatever you like. Um, so zinc, aqueous zinc will drop out as it binds with uh, sulfide. Um, and we have a second line in here. So some of the work that we did uh, indicates that zinc also binds up with carbonate, perhaps before um, we're getting sulfide, sulfate reducing conditions persisting. Um, so it's just another precipitate to consider when you're looking at these systems holistically. Um, so we have lab, pilot, and field scale systems to address our questions. Uh, first, we're going to go for chapters two and three. We're going to focus on some pilot scale columns that Freeport MacMorrin um, kindly built for us. These are 20 liter columns with uh, organic substrate permutations that we were able to sample spatially. So they're a pretty neat system. Um, next, in chapter four, we'll get into these lab scale columns um, where we uh, tested uh, different inocula inoculum regimes. So we have uh, no inoculum, live, uh, live anaerobic digester granule inoculum, and a sterilized inoculum, so triple autoclaved. And finally, um, I looked at a field scale bioreactor that had run for 10 years uh, and did a really good job at um, mitigating toxicity from, from a real mine. Uh, this is sort of an unprecedented look into a reactor because we have a three-dimensional profile. Uh, so right into chapter two. And when we start every chapter, I'll first go over these motivations, um, which is kind of the point of all of it. And at the end of each chapter, we'll see how we did with each of those motivations. So chapter two has been published in Environmental Science and Technology uh, back in January. So our motivation for this study, and these are our pilot scale columns, was we wanted to assess which organic substrates worked better versus those who may, that maybe didn't work so well. Um, and we wanted to determine the role of that carbon in community selection and contrast those communities based on performance. So we're going to look, so this is worth paying attention to because it's going to be the experimental design for the next two chapters that we consider. Um, these are our 20 liter columns. It was a 500 day long experiment, so pretty extensive. We had those white ports, which we were able to take out basically tea bags of organic substrate, which we could perform DNA extractions, geochemical extractions, and other analyses on. Um, and then adjacent to those, we have those gray and blue liquid sampling ports. We sampled these at 107 days, 345, and 494 days. Um, the different permutations <clears throat> are down at the bottom, and alfalfa sawdust, or sorry, the ones on the left with A's in them, so alfalfa is A, sawdust and alfalfa is SA, WA would be wood chip and alfalfa mix, uh, WSA is a transitional column with some wood chip sawdust and alfalfa, and all the way on the right um, are wood chip sawdust is WS, sawdust is S, W is just wood chips. So to the left we're looking at more labile carbon, um, more easily biodegradable, and on the right we're looking at more recalcitrant carbon sources. Um, and because this is a huge part of what we're going to be talking about today, I wanted to spend another minute going over this. So our alfalfa dominated columns, that SA, WA, and A, those have a higher total nitrogen, um, higher zinc removal, higher cellulose to lignin ratios, and an abundance of acetate based on some of our microbial um, analyses. And our wood chip uh, columns, in, in contrast, uh, there's competition for lactate, there's lower zinc removal, lower total nitrogen, and more lignin than cellulose. So, um, and everything that's going to be in green is going to correspond to our labile carbon sources. 
and everything in purple is going to correspond to our recalcitrant carbon sources. So the first thing we wanted to look at is just zinc removal. So this is just in versus out over time. Um, and so again, our green columns, our uh, labile carbon sources, are removing quite a bit more zinc um, throughout the experiment, and our purple uh, recalcitrant carbon sources quite a bit less. Um, and that orange WSA is a transitional column. We'll talk more about that one later. But it exhibited, it was the only column that exhibited a really stark difference in performance over the course of the experiment. Um, one of the things to note is that sort of lime green line that corresponds to WA um, for the colorblind people, that one. Uh, so that is the only alfalfa col or labile column that contained wood chips. And that's important because pine wood has been shown to contain some antimicrobial terpenes. So it could have taken some time for uh, the, the substrate to wear down to the point where those terpenes were, were no longer present. And that explains a little bit of the delay there. Um, so we did next generation sequencing of these, of these substrates. Um, contrasting them. And what I did, because you get, you get thousands and thousands of OTUs back, and how do you begin to make sense of them in a highly selective environment? And what I did was I uh, assigned a core microbiome. And what that means is we're just looking at the organisms that are present in every column. So these 12 or so organisms are present in every single column. Um, again, the organisms that are adjacent to the purple ribbons in this visualization are the ones that are more abundant in our recalcitrant carbon sources. And the organisms adjacent to the green ribbons are the ones um, that were more abundant in our labile carbon sources. When we look at this from a, a statistical perspective, I did an analysis of similarity test between uh, the sawdust and alfalfa, or the labile columns and the recalcitrant columns. And they do have statistically different communities, um, if you weren't already convinced that those look different. And with time, they did not change. So what that tells me is that organic substrate is a stronger selective driver than any environmental perturbations um, these columns experienced over the 500 days. So let's look at these one at a time here and um, talk about these clades. So, uh, here are recalcitrant columns. So this is the relative abundance of these core clades in our recalcitrant columns. We're seeing um, a lot of fermenting organisms. We don't. We can get into what those are later, um, but a lot less of our conserved sulfate-reducing organism, the D-sulfosporocytus. Um, a couple key players missing from this visualization are Discanomonas and Azospira. Those were not included just because they overwhelmed the visualization, but azospira has been shown to consume lactate and to oxidize sulfites. Um, next, let's look at the relative abundance of the core organisms in our labile columns. So D. sulfosporocytus, our conserved sulfate-reducing bacteria in these systems, was significantly higher in these columns than in the uh, recalcitrant ones. And we have Wasalia and Treponema, which have been shown to produce lactic acid. And that's important because our, our, uh, our conserved sulfate-reducing organism likes to oxidize lactic acid. Um, and so <clears throat> you're really contrasting a system where there's competition for lactic acid um, with that azospira in our, in our last slide um, with a system that's producing lactic acid. So we have a potentially competitive relationship here. Um, I also performed a canonical correspondence analysis. So the way you look at this is the closer um, the points are together, the more similar those communities are. And, all, and so the arrows, um, if they're less than 90 degrees from each other, those are positively correlated metadata parameters. And if they're more than 90 degrees from each other, they're negatively correlated. If they're 180 degrees from each other, they're not correlated. Um, so here we see alfalfa content, sulfate reduction rate, that's SRR, and zinc removal are all positively correlated with each other. And all of the communities associated with labile carbon sources cluster there as well. Um, in contrast, 
We have wood chips that's negatively correlated with zinc removal because it's more than 90 degrees, right? And we also have the relative abundance of our core clades in here. So any of these clades that we're grouping with our labile carbon sources um, cluster over here and are positively correlated with those positive performance metrics. So, yeah. Um, so when, when you're doing next generation sequencing, 16S, you, you want to say, okay, so we know who's there, and that's great, and we can start making some inferences about what they're doing based on the literature. Uh, so to, at that, to this end, we did a putative metabolic flow chart with our core clades, and this is based on a literature review, but to really, uh, to really delineate what these organisms are doing in the system, we would need first like a metagenomic inquiry to know the potential um, that these these clades or these clades have, and if we wanted to actually know what they were doing, we would have to do um, a transcriptomic analysis. But we did pretty good with this. I think. Um, so back to our original motivations for chapter two. What did what did we really want to accomplish here? Um, we did a step straight permutation assessment, and we found that labile carbon outperforms recalcitrant. Um, we want to determine the role of complex carbon in community selection, and it appears that labile carbon selects for more sulfate-reducing bacteria, at least after 500 days, um, and a higher abundance of lactic acid bacteria. And when we contrast communities that trended with good performance versus bad performance, or not bad, not as good performance, uh, we do see significantly different communities. So this is the paper that we submitted last night at like, what, 9 o'clock? <laughs> and um, this is the same environment or experimental setup as the last chapter, so these are those pilot scale columns. But what we are more interested in here is the spatial dynamics. So we had those nice, you know, top, middle, and bottom ports. Um, we could start to say about what's happening in a specific reactive substrate. So that's pretty cool because a lot of times we're looking at these systems as an in versus an out, and that's about it. Um, so I wanted to, motivation behind this was I wanted to delineate the distribution of inorganic ligands, so things like sulfide, carbonates, um, that can bind up with metals, um, and see if that differs throughout the length of the column. Um, are there differences in pre spatial precipitation? Are those reflected? in community structure? Do we have a, a spatial microbial component as well? And can we start to say anything about indicator clades? So are there organisms that trend with better performance versus not so good performance? Um, and in case you didn't believe me, we are seeing very different precipitation uh, between our labile on the left and our recalcitrant on the right columns. Um, these are field emissions scanning electron micrographs that we did of uh, some sawdust and alfalfa hay substrate and those spherical things that you, the spherical precipitates you see are very similar to um, what was observed in LeBrun's 2000, which was spalerite, um, zinc sulfide precipitated in a uh, mining biofilm. So that we think, you know, we're removing a lot of zinc and we're producing a lot of sulfide in these systems, so it would make sense that we're getting zinc sulfide. In contrast, in our more recalcitrant columns, so this is just a wood chip column, we're seeing what looks very similar to gypsum. Um, and we do know that these systems are oversaturated with respect to gypsum, so uh, it's not surprising we'd see a lot of that. But they stand in stark contrast from each other in how they're precipitating. So from the aqueous data, we were able to say how things were removed or where things were removed um, in each reactive substrate. So at 107 days, we did an initial sampling event where we just looked at the, the liquid data. So this is just aqueous zinc removal um, with depth and between columns. And we don't really see any appreciable trend um, in or differences in removal between the columns. But after 345 days, we start to see that divergence that we saw um, in the last chapter, where our labile carbon sources are removing a lot more zinc than our more recalcitrant ones. But what's more interesting about this is we can see where that removal is happening. So the dark green 
corresponds to more removal of yellow, corresponds to less, if you can't see the numbers. But um, we're seeing a lot more removal in the top and middle. Um, and this could be either, well, it's probably because they ran out of, um, the columns ran out of zinc by the time they got to the lower port. So they were removing zinc so efficiently that by the time the water got to the lower port, there was nothing left to remove, essentially. Um, and then after 494 days, um, we're seeing still really good removal in our labile columns, maybe a little better in our wood chip uh, or recalcitrant columns, but not so much. Um, another interesting thing that we see is this massive change in performance in our column WSA. So that was that transitional column that we talked about before. Um, after 345 days, we're only seeing like a net removal of seven milligrams per day in that column, and that goes up two orders of magnitude. <laughs> so that's quite a transition. Also, the removal front in our labile columns has moved down, it looks like. Uh, we also did geochemical extractions. So these were sequential extractions where we're differentiating between sulfide bound, so the dark gray, and absorbed exchangeable carbonate bound fractions that were immobilized in, uh, in, in these reactors. So the thing you see right away is that our labile columns, SA, WA, and A, those, are, uh, those have a lot more zinc in the sulfide bound fraction than any of our other treatments. Um, w, uh, our recalcitrant columns are removing much less zinc in the, in the sulfide bound fraction, and WSA falls somewhere in the middle. It's worth noting that this was something we only had the material to do at the end of the experiment, so this is only from one time point. Um, we probably could have gotten more information if we did it from both, but we did it. Um, yeah. And then we don't see any real trends with the absorb exchangeable carbonate bound sink, and that's probably because there's limestone mixed throughout the column homogeneously, so that carbonate driven precipitation was likely happening evenly throughout. So these are, this is the same data, but we're looking at a spatial trend here. The whole point of this chapter is a spatial aspect. Um, and what we see is we have an appreciable trend for our labile columns where we're getting more sulfide bound zinc higher up. And that's <coughs> analogous to what we saw at 345 days in our, um, in our aqueous removal data. We are not seeing that same trend with our more recalcitrant substrates. Um, and this, you, this could be because there's more sulfide in the higher, in the, uh, higher up in the columns. It could be because there's no more zinc left to immobilize in the bottom of the columns. Or it could be because of these pHs. We expect about half of our sulfide to be gaseous, and so it's bubbling up through the column and <coughs> perhaps precipitating things higher up. Um, so this is our EDX data. This is each of these dots represents a running average of the atomic mass percent of zinc, sulfur, and calcium. Uh, we plotted them on ternary diagrams because we have to visualize three different things, right? Um, so starting off in the bottom left here at A, we're looking at our recalcitrant carbon or our recalcitrant carbon sources, and what looks and what looks like a smattering of precipitation actually has some spatial and temporal aspect to it. So in our legend up there, our earlier time point are the open symbols, and our later time point is the closed symbols. Uh, the top is circle, the middle is square, and the bottom is diamond. So in our recalcitrant carbon sources, we're seeing more calcium and sulfur higher up in the column and earlier on in the experiment. As we go deeper in the column or later in the experiment, we're seeing um, our precipitates start to cluster in the zinc and sulfur corner. So we're actually seeing um, an elemental association shift, the biotic aspect of inoculation. Um, we made these small disks, which I have for you guys to look at if you want. <laughs> One of those, I don't know. Um, so this is what we did our synchrotron analyses on. Um, and so I'm going to go over the motivation behind my part of this project. I want to determine the speciation and crystallinity of our immobilized metals. So 
we do see some differences in precipitation, right? We're seeing our sulfide-bound metals and our absorbed exchangeable carbonate-bound metals. And I want to see if we could see that in our Supertron uh, data. And I want to see how precipitates uh, varied under biotic and abiotic inoculation regimes. Um, and do we see any competition for binding sites in these systems? So a quick primer on um, XAS technology. Uh, we're going to be looking at spectra that look a lot like this today. And everything that is left of that big peak is going to be our, our zanes, our near edge spectroscopy. And that tells us um, information about uh, the locally associated uh, elements and our oxidation state. Uh, and we basically take these spectra, we fit them to a library, and we come up with uh, what we're looking at. Um, next, this is relevant to what we're going to discuss today. Every element has its own absorb absorption energy. We're going to be focusing on zinc and iron, but all of, all of these energies are relevant. So when you're making these XRF maps that I'm going to show you, you have to map at these energies to see those elements. Uh, finally, a quick take home. Everything, that, when you see uh, an edge that's at a lower energy, that is a reduced species. If you see that edge coming up at a higher energy, that's an oxidized species. And that's just because a reduced species, it's easier to knock an electron off a reduced species with an X ray than with an oxidized species. Uh, oh, can you guys see that? I can see it yesterday afternoon. So, this is a XRF map of our live inoculum column. Um, and for these, these maps I'm going to show you, everything, is, everything that's red is going to be zinc. Um, everything that's sulfur is going to be blue. And everything that's iron is going to be green. And so, back to basic color principles red and blue make purple. And so, we see a lot of purple in this image. I hope you can see it. Um, and relating to that, we see a pretty strong zinc and sulfur correlation. That's an R squared of 0.82. Um, and so we have all these small numbers on here. And these correspond to spectra that we took. And we can talk about how those were selected later if you guys want to know. Um, but what I want you to take home from these spectra is that we fit to a library is these small notches um, correspond to crystalline sphalerite as opposed to this more sloopy shoulder, which corresponds to amorphous zinc sulfide. So we're saying something about crystallinity with these spectra. And it's worth noting that the more crystalline something is, the less likely it is to remobilize. Um, so take home from this XRF map is that these active granule columns had a strong zinc sulfur correlation and a crystalline sphalerite presence. Um, so this is a sterile inoculum XRF map, a little bit different in coloration than what we see there. So we're seeing a lot more red, in a, and that's a granule, that big massive supernova thing that looks <laughs> that's there, that, that's a granule. Um, so that is our inoculum. And we're seeing a lot of zinc in there. We're not seeing a whole lot of iron associated with that granule, and that's going to become important later. Uh, we see still ha we still have a zinc and sulfur correlation here, maybe a little weaker, R squared of 0.77. But probably more worth noting here is the bifurcation in this correlation. So we have zinc associated with sulfur, but not in the way we expect to see it. And what we think that could be is uh, zinc co-precipitated with gypsum. So zinc and calcium sulfate together. Um, modeling suggests this, because uh, we are oversaturated with respect to gypsum in these. And um, unfortunately, this is where there's a little bit of art to this. Um, there is no perfect library spectra for zinc associated with calcium sulfate. We just don't have it. Um, when we look at our spectra here, so they sort of look the same as the last one. We still see, uh, like number 27, we have that notched sphalerite that we saw in our active granule columns. 
we have more of this uh, amorphous stylorite, but we do have a peak shift, so 23, um, and that we think is gypsum, is a gypsum. Uh, let's see, so we have very little iron in the granule. We have a weaker bifurcated zinc and sulfur correlation. So the reason I'm highlighting the less iron associated with the granule is because before we use these granules as inoculum, we kindly took them from uh, the core's anaerobic digester, they were largely iron and sulfur together. Um, zinc has a higher binding affinity to sulfide than iron. And so what we're seeing is zinc is replacing iron in that granule. Um, in case you don't believe me, we're going to look at some excess spectra. So you guys are familiar with what's on the left. We've seen this. this. These are the zanes. And then remember what I told you, everything after that big peak is going to be our extended x-ray fine structure. And that's what that middle graph is, um, just magnified and normalized. And finally, we Fourier transform that, so just lay it on your x-axis, and uh, those are our Fourier transformed x-axis. But let's focus here. Um, so what we're seeing is we're seeing zinc and iron, this, this secondary bump right here, zinc and iron um, are associated. So that's, that's zinc's nearest neighbor. And we only see that in our live inoculum columns. So that, that's G up there. Um, we're producing about 30 times more sulfide in those columns than in our sterile columns. And so when there's no competition for sulfide, we're seeing zinc and iron together. But when there is competition for sulfide, so in our sterilized granule columns, we don't see them together. So zinc is kicking iron out of the way so it can take up the sulfide. So let's look back at our motivation and see how we did. Um, so determining speciation and crystallinity of immobilized metals. So we see different zinc sulfides based on our inoculation regimes, but we still see zinc sulfides forming in our abiotic inoculum. So that means that abiotic inoculum does have some um, implications for binding, but we see a lot more in our biotic regime. Um, and when sulfide is limited, it does appear that binding hierarchy matters. So this is when we're kicking, we're kicking iron out and zinc is taking up that sulfide being selfish. Um, finally, I want to talk to you guys about um, the field bioreactor study that I got to do. This was pretty cool because I don't think there's ever been a three-dimensional assessment of a field reactor. Uh, this is not the reactor that I'm going to talk about. There's no pictures of that given to me. Um, this is a reactor that I worked on at Freeport, uh, the Iron King. And I just wanted to show you what it looks like. You could walk over one of these and not even know it's there. Um, and so let's go over our motivations behind this field assessment. I wanted to see if there are geochemical horizons um, where we're precipitating differently with depth. Do we see a certain metal higher up and a different metal deeper down? Do we see more sulfides deeper, more carbonate bound metals higher? Um, do sulfide reducing bioreactors have regions of enhanced removal? So maybe if we don't see it in profile, do, does one corner work better than another? Um, and do these geochemical trends have a microbial component? and what organisms account for that perceived difference if it exists. So this is what my actual reactor looks like. Um, these are the samples that we collected or that were collected and sent to me from a secret location. And um, we're going to look at the first two feet because as you see, that's where I have the most coverage. Um, this is just how we sampled in profile. That's a plan view for your edification. Um, so we're looking at the same digest that I did previously, so differentiating between absorbed exchangeable carbonate bound and sulfide bound metals. We're looking at aluminum, iron, manganese, and zinc. So we don't have too many trends with depth. Um, these brackets represent p-values. Um, they're highlighted if they're significant. But we're not seeing a whole lot of differences with depth. Uh, probably the most interesting take home from this is that manganese was the only metal that had greater mass bound up 
in the carbonate bound fraction than in the sulfide bound fraction. And that's just because manganese sulfides are pretty soluble under these conditions. Um, and when we look at the absorbed exchangeable carbonate bound results with respect to region, so now we're looking at each corner and the center, and we're looking again at iron, manganese, and zinc, we don't really see that much either, except for iron. Um, and that's probably because that's where the water was pumped into the reactor. They wouldn't tell me that, but I could tell them that. Um, and it, what we expect at these pHs and at these iron concentrations is for iron oxyhydroxides to pretty much immediately precipitate. And if we do go back, um, indeed iron is higher at the top. So if this was pumped in shallow, it was probably precipitating in the middle pretty rapidly. Um, but that's the only real uh, carbonate bound regional trend. But what we're more interested in probably is our sulfide bound trends. And here we see an, we see an interesting uh, pattern. There seems to be more aluminum in this corner BC2. And then, you know, iron BC4, BC2, more manganese in BC2, more zinc in BC2. So there's, there's something special happening there. And I wonder if our uh, community data stacks up with that. So there's a PCA that I layered sulfide bound metal data on. So again, the closer the dots are together, the more similar the communities. The larger the dots, the more metal removal you get. And so each color represents a different region. And the shades are kind of hard to see, but they're less important. Each shade represents a depth in inches. And what did you know? That region BC2 that we observed more sulfide bound metal in also has a statistically different community. So that's great, but I wonder what organisms are responsible for that difference. And so I, um, I performed differential abundance and on everything that was greater, present at greater than 1%. And it looks like we have just a handful of organisms that are significantly more abundant in that one region BC2. And I've just highlighted the putative function of these organisms with different shapes. And what it comes down to is we have more sulfate reducing organisms in that corner of the reactor than relative to the other, um, other regions. And in those other regions, we are seeing a relative uh, enrichment of methane related metabolisms, largely methanogens, but it's kind of hard to say because this is putative, right? Um, so this tells me that, okay, we have an abundance of organic carbon. Are the sulfate reducing bacteria competing with the methanogenic archaea for this carbon where there's so much to go around? Or perhaps are we getting preferential flow of sulfate to that one region and therefore we have more sulfate reducing organisms? I would argue for the latter. So let's see how we did here. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of horizons uh, in profile with respect to depth or with respect to metal removal, uh, but we did see regions that had a uh, difference in metal removal. And those geochemical trends had a microbial component where that community was that had more sulfide bound metal was also statistically different. And finally, um, those sulfate reducing bacteria are what made up um, that difference. So finally, just one slide of conclusions for you guys. Um, really the whole point of this is to build a more informed sulfate reducing bioreactor. We want to do better treatment, right? So I think that this body of work has better informed substrate selection, which is a huge selective driver for the microbial component of these systems. Um, we saw that those communities did trend with performance. And um, we informed spatial removal mechanisms. Where are we getting this precipitation? Um, and we looked at the stability of precipitates as associated with different inoculation regimes. And finally, we assessed uh, a field scale reactor. And I think the next step there is to tease apart, is this competition driven or is it just a more salt fade is distributed there? Um, and you know, you do these experiments and you look back and you say, you really wish you did this one analysis or one analysis. Um, I would have loved to do a better organic carbon characterization, especially of my, my uh, pilot scale columns. Over time, I could have looked at maturity and aromaticity of the carbon, so that just means you know, how bioavailable is it.
I bet we would have seen some pretty cool differences between our labile and our calcitrin source columns. Um, so now we know, I think we have a pretty good grasp on who's there, but what do they have the potential to do? Um, begs for a metagenomic inquiry that Rob Armstrong's sort of working on right now. And uh, we need a better understanding of flow in these systems. Is, is that a selective driver in and of itself? Um, I think it's pretty apparent from our our uh, field data, but again, we don't have flow data to go with that, so it's sort of a hypothesis right now. So stepping back and looking at the big picture again, so this is a uranium mine. A lot of these pictures come from the daily overview. These are This is an awesome site, uh, lots of great mining pictures. <laughs> and you know, they say if it's not farmed, it's mined, and I think we have to mine, but we have to do it responsibly. And I hope this research has added to that, and I hope we can continue to mine and mine well. Uh, with that, thank you guys for coming. <laughs> Mom and Dad, thank you for traveling all this way. Uh, Rune, thank you for keeping me sane. Chris and Marina, thank you for taking off work. <laughs> um, my funding sources, NSF, uh, Department of Energy. Rob brought in some uh, money from Marie Curie to help out with this. Uh, Freeport and... Uh, the synchrotron uh, did a lot of uh, work with me, had me for summer school, taught me a lot of really great things about synchrotron technology. I had a great time with that. Um, the gem lab, you guys are amazing. Kristen, thank you for all your statistical guidance. <laughs> um, Dr. Stephanie Carr, who I think is tuning in. Uh, Dong Lee, who helped me a lot with um, when I was getting started doing bioinformatics. Uh, Tess Weathers, Dave Wono, Gary, thank you so much for, for your statistical guidance as well. Um, Dr. Blake Stamps, who couldn't be here today. And Zach, thanks for helping me set up today, buddy. <laughs> uh, Chris, Chelsea, Jeff, Jeff coming all the way from Arizona, thank you. Um, Laura Leonard, who's here, who's helped me quite a bit, thank you. Uh, Brad Burback and Will Porter helped me do a lot of that EDX data that was a lot to collect. They are not here, but they, they're great guys to work with. Um, my incredible committee who has given me guidance and support through this whole process, uh, Josh Sharp, you've been an amazing advisor, highly recommended to anybody. <laughs> um, and Rob, who I've worked really closely with over the years, he knows a lot about this project. Um, Dr. Linda Figueroa, thank you for teaching me how to think like an engineer. <laughs> and uh, John Spear, for your microbial excellence um, and guidance there. And Chris and Tina, thank you so much for all the chemistry you've taught me. I'm not that scared of it anymore. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sam Webb, Courtney Roach at the Synchrotron, Dr. Lee Landhammer, and Tom Wildman, their institutional knowledge of these reactors is pretty incredible. So with that, I'll take questions. <laughs> What's up, Chris? Um, I was just curious, do you know how they built the Zane's uh, spectra the libraries? The libraries? It's from um, like a pure mineral. So a lot of the concentrations um, that I, because I, I can also do concentration maps, right? And so I get a standard of a pure mineral or a pure like zinc, what do we, what do we use? Like zinc tel telluride or something. Um, and so that's what you build your spectra off of. Okay. So it's just somebody had like, yeah, and for like a gypsum zinc. Right. And even even in like even that, it, like is it 50-50 or is right. it 20, you know, 80? Yeah, so you it's you have to know the proportion, right? And you um, you have to know that it's even there. So yeah. Yeah, Kristen. Um, uh, how do you actually go about Um, so that's that's a good question. Uh, I like to say that these are a build it and they will come sort of situation. If you poise for the right conditions, the organisms will flourish. Um, the pilot scale reactors, we did not have any inoculum initially. Is that right? No, we didn't have any inoculum initially. They were at 380 <coughs> days. They were they, there was an attempt to jumpstart those columns that weren't performing as well. 
Um, we did a 10% by mass uh, manure inoculation. Uh, so we just put some manure in there. And that actually didn't affect the community, which isn't shocking because later, you know, later on in an experiment, it's a lot harder to change the entire community structure um, than doing, you know, an initial inoculation. <clears throat> so when you build them, if you include inoculum, there's obviously um, quite a difference in performance um, than if you, you don't. It's really just based off of like yeah, so these sulfate concentrations were like 130 milligrams per liter, um, and all of the oxygens consumed. You don't really have any nitrate in there. You don't have any other more uh, favorable electron acceptors. So you're driven right to sulfate reducing conditions. And that being said, if you're if you're running out of sulfate, right? So we had sulfate coming out in the effluent pretty steadily. But if you're running out of sulfate, you could run into methanogenesis as well, right? So like, sorry. No. Nope. This is kind of related to field questions. So if they were to build a sulfate reducing bioreactor <laughs> at like one of these um, contaminated field sites, mm -hmm. essentially all they have to do is like dig a pit, put a bunch of labile carbon sources in it, and then run the effluent filter. Uh, I'd probably put like a barrier underneath that pit, but yeah. Uh, and I would add some buffering agent. Um, I don't know what the pH of the water is. Like mining impacted water varies massively with respect to chemistry, right? So if you have like a fairly neutral water, um, you could flow it into the reactor just as organic substrate. Um, you might want to be careful about how you select your organic substrate, but <laughs> um, that should work. Uh, if the water is pH 2, 3, you might want to do either a pre-buffering stage or mix some limestone in. Um, these reactors have also been shown to clog if you have a lot of iron 3 in your water, just because it, uh, iron oxyhydroxides are kind of fluffy precipitates, if that's an appropriate term. And uh, that can cause some clogging issues. So you could pre-precipitate your iron by running it through limestone, um, or if you don't have that concern, yeah, just go for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What kind of flow rates are you running through those reactors? Um, so the conventional loading rate. Um, so Tom Wildman came up with this, and I guess you can you can go either way with it, but it was. Uh, 0.3 moles of metal is removed per meter cubed per day. Are those right numbers, Linda? That's what Tom says. That's what Tom says. But um, that's, a, that's a ballpark for design. Yeah. He asked about the flow. You know the flows. Okay. Yeah, the flows. The flows were variable. Um, for my pilot scale systems, let's see if I have that data actually. Um, oh, do you, do you know the residence times for each home? Oh, yeah, like about 30 days. 30 days? Yeah. So yeah. I was, you did most of the, you focused a lot on, on zinc mm. as your contaminant. Is there a reason why you chose zinc or did you look at anything? Um, Water we were dealing with is came from a gold and copper mine. Um, the pilot scale systems that was uh, that came from an actual mine that water and so it was just it was just zinc rich. Um, also, zinc isn't the nastiest metal you can deal with, right? So it's preferential <laughs> to to handle zinc. Um, Rob's water did have some cadmium nickel. Um, other things in it, but yeah, it was there. <laughs> hey, Marina. Hey, it's a dumb question. I don't know if it's hot enough. But um, how does water come in and out? Do you have like the discharge pipes or the release field? And then how do you get out into that long of water? Such a Marina question. Uh, so, in the field reactor, um, I think it was pumped in towards the middle and then allowed to flow out and down through the reactor, right? Um, in our in our pilot scale columns, it was just a downflow system. Um, in the 
the col the, in the reactor that I showed you guys a picture of, the water flows out into a polishing pond and then often into these grass fields because there are certain grasses that they themselves do like phytoremediation of metals and sequester metals in the grass. So, um, but the water coming out is, do I have a picture of the pipes? No. Oh. <laughs> the water, uh, the water coming out of these systems is pretty good. Like our, our zinc removal and our pilot scale systems was like upwards of 90% in the ones that were doing well. So they work well and they work for a long time. Um, but there is, there is a collection system underneath. I haven't built one. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now, if there are no more questions, we can dismiss the audience. So, the to go. So, thank you again for your presentation.